Okay, folks, we just passed the hour. So let's, uh, uh, before we get into the study today, uh, just wanted to bring you up to speed as to what we have tentatively planned. Uh, just wanted to discuss that very briefly with you. And if you have any thoughts, you are welcome to share it. Uh, for this year, we are going to, uh, you will see um, less of my face. Uh, and I have um, asking Praveen to um, sort of uh, pitch in now. And for the next three months, we, you will probably see both our faces more often. And hopefully after uh, the quarter is gone, we will hopefully have other more people uh, part from part of our speaking team join in and uh, share studies. Now, with regards to the studies, we just discussed a few things. And uh, obviously, we want to have a variety of methods, like I think we discussed last time. Uh, we will continue a series. And the reason we want to continue, uh, we also want to include a series is obviously to make study uh, more substantial. Um, we want the study to be knowledgeable. Uh, I know that it must be inspiring. It should be inspirational. Uh, it should be helpful for us. But on the other hand, it must not just be a devotional or, or more attuned to a sermon, but perhaps doing more of a solid, you know, Bible study. So, so I am going to start a series today, and I'm not sure how long it will take to finish, but uh, we will see how it goes. But then we will intersperse it with standalone studies. Uh, we will bring videos, we will bring articles, and so that way we will maintain some variety. I'm presuming that uh, Praveen will also start a series. So that way we will try to make it as substantial as possible. Good to see Betty Matthews and Mrs. Matthews. Thank you for joining. Hopefully <laughs> you can stay the hour with us. Right, excellent. So yeah, so this is the plan that we are going to have for this year. Uh, uh, for today and for the next Wednesday, I will do the study and then Praveen will join in after that, bringing his series uh, into, into it. Like I said, from time to time, we will take a break from the series and we will do something standalone. Uh, like I always say, if you have any suggestions, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share, any subjects, any topics, uh, any um, you know, scriptures to be uh, explained or any particular topic that you'd like. I know Mr. Rao has already told me that we need to discuss a particular topic. Uh, was it the covenants, Mr. Rao? Uh, we wanted to discuss the old and the new covenants. So, right. Right. I remember you also saying that uh, what is the role of the law today? Uh, what kind of law are we under? So we'll, we'll bring in some of those thoughts, hopefully this year. Right. So thank you. And uh, certainly thank you all for joining in. It's always um, very, I would say, motivational for us to be able to dig into the scriptures uh, and to be able to present it to all of you. OK, having said that, uh, any any thoughts on what I just uh, shared with you? Uh, any suggestions? Um, otherwise, what we will do is we'll open with prayer. Uh, which Praveen will do for us, and then I will uh, explain the subject we want to deal with today. All right, feel free to share it even towards the end. And like we uh, have done in the past, uh, you know, several sessions, we will keep it, we'll try our best to keep it for one hour, and there will be a presentation of a topic, and then we will uh, get into a discussion. Okay, so Praveen, can you do the honors for us and lead us in, 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 the, in asking God for blessing our study today? Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we come to thy presence, Lord, thanking you for giving us another opportunity to come together and to study your word, Lord. Lord, as we have started 
a new year with a new plan we ask for your grace and guidance uh, especially of for teachers who are, i mean for those who are ministering your word oh lord lord i pray that our studies may be inspiring and edifying our members of oh god grant us your revelation and illumination as we study your word your word and we may mutually encourage uh, each other in the discussions uh, <clears throat> and we ask for your presence in the discussions as well lord through everything we do your name be exalted we want to hear your voice through your son open our hearts and minds through you by your spirit lord the time we spend in your presence may be a time that is fruitful to our spiritual lives and uh, may encourage us and edify and equip us thank you very much for listening to us in jesus name we pray amen amen and thank you prabhit for leading us uh let me see vincent chan has joined us pauline has joined us and mrs noah has joined us thank you very much for all all of you for joining us and let's hope that this hour will be uh, fruitful for uh, for all of us uh today's study i thought i was thinking about uh a series that might be helpful for us knowledgeable that, you know something that we need to know and i felt uh that i will start a series on basically church history uh so we will definitely delve into the scriptures but we will also get into a lot of history and uh let me share my screen with you and uh you'll probably see how i've titled it okay uh let me just see uh if i can all right okay actually yes this is the <laughs> title of my study the story of the church that's how i've titled it the story of the church right and you and i know that uh, we the church has been in existence and has continued to uh, serve humanity for almost 2000 years now 2000 years plus and i believe that there are very important events in church history this is the church after it was established and over the two millennia uh, some significant events have taken place and i believe that we as uh, followers of christ members of the church you know the the universal church uh, the church which is you know all over the world need to be uh mindful we need to be knowledgeable about the how the ch- how church events have had you know have unfolded now we are not sure whether we are finally in the you know the the last part of the existence of the church and of course moving into the kingdom but uh nevertheless we carry on at least to understand how the church has existed over these many years now so the intent of my study is to obviously make you and i knowledgeable about how the church has functioned over the 2000 years and more importantly to see what relevant lessons we can learn from the study all right uh, obviously there is no point in just uh, rehashing dry history but what can we glean from it and i'm hoping that i can also spur the discussion with some discussion questions that i can pose towards the end uh of course also taking the questions that you might have just to bring into perspective why we are doing this study i'd like you to notice what the apostle paul says i'm presuming you can all see my screen i am reading from 1 corinthians chapter 10 notice how paul uh, writes about history as such in verse 11 he says these things happen to them talking about the nation of israel as examples and were written down as warnings for us he is including himself and the new testament church on whom the culmination of the ages has come verse 12 he goes on to say so if you think you are standing firm 
be careful that you don't fall. So the context here is the apostle is uh, helping the, uh, the Corinthian church to understand not to forget history uh, and to understand where the church has come to be and what has been the previous history. And obviously he is referring to the journey of Israel as a nation, its experiences. What are the lessons we can learn? So he is citing this. He is uh, encouraging them to learn. He is citing it to encourage learning. So uh, if you know the Apostle Paul believes that history is a great learning platform, and why? So that we may avoid making mistakes from the past, right? Notice he says, written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. So he's basically saying, we have come now to almost the end of, you know, we are in the last age, you could say. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are standing firm in the, in the faith. So hopefully that will be a motivation for us to learn uh, church history. An interesting quotation from Bruce Shelley says the following uh, in his book, uh, uh, Church History in Plain Language. Many Christians today suffer from historical amnesia. The time between the apostles and their own day is one giant blank. So I feel that's a very uh, pertinent quotation. Amnesia talking about, you know, forgetfulness. Uh, many of us just don't know much about church history. We know about uh, New Testament times. We know about Old Testament times. But for the last 2,000 years, perhaps many of us may not be as knowledgeable. And hence, the quotation is quite apt. So what do I hope to do uh, is uh, just give you an overview of what we will do today. And then we will carry on. I want to first bring uh, how Jesus announces the beginnings of the church. All right. Uh, so before we get into the history uh, element of the 2000 years, I want us to just go back uh, and look at how Jesus uh, even talks about the church, how he talks about uh, you know, the beginnings of the church. So we will look at very briefly the birth of the church and we will look at the passage where Pentecost is mentioned. Along with this, I want to very, uh, you know, briefly mention something called Pax Romana, which uh, I'm, some of you might know is called the Peace of Rome. I will, I will try to bring the relevance of the Pax Romana and the timing of the birth of the church. Uh, and I think there is some relevance there we can look into. Now, if we have time, we will also look at the timeline of the church, if we do have time. Uh, I will get into a discussion after uh, these two main thoughts. And then if we have time, we'll get into the timeline of the church. That is basically uh, an overview of what I will, dis I will uh, follow today. Okay, having mentioned that, let me just quickly go to the beginnings of the church, how Jesus announces the beginnings of the church. If you notice on your screen, I'm going to quote from Matthew chapter 16, very, very famous words of Jesus. Uh, when in verse 13, he says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disci disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Now, I'm not going to read the entire passage because my focus is the church. So uh, the question that Jesus asks, I, and many of you will remember the answer that Peter gave, but I'm just dropping down to verse 18 and it says, and I tell you, this is Jesus, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Okay, this is Jesus announcing the beginnings of the church, all right? Jesus very 
clearly and categorically says that he will build his church. So the church is a, an institution, you could say, an enterprise that is God-breathed. It is initiated by the church. No human being has, uh, you know, fathomed the beginnings of the church or the humans are not the big, you know, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The entrepreneurs of the church. Jesus Christ is. We must keep that in mind. He says, I will build my church. Now, there is a controversy here, uh, which still remains raging today. When Jesus says, I, you know, I, 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 on this rock, I will build my church. What is this rock? Right? What is this rock? And some people, some uh, denominations will believe that uh, this is referring to Peter. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, and some people take the rock to be Peter. And so, hence, some denominations will say Peter was the first pope or the first leader of the church. Now, that is one way uh, some people look at it. Some others say that Christ is the rock. He is identified as the rock in the Old Testament. The apostle Peter, or rather Paul, identifies him as indeed the rock. Uh, and so uh, many say that the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. It is on this rock or referring to himself, I will build my church, all right? Uh, now, there is a third explanation. And if you look at your right uh, of your screen, you will notice uh, a kind of a rock. This is Caesarea Philippi as, as it is today. And uh, this is a place where Baal, the god Baal was worshipped, right? Uh, it, Baal is the name of this god, which we know from the Old Testament times, and later identified with another god called Pan, P-A-N, right? But Baal is where this, this place probably was where, uh, you know, he was worshipped. Uh, <clears throat> Baal God, as one uh, commentary says, is described as being in the valley of Le Lebanon below Mount Hermon. So this is very close to Mount Hermon, where uh, the uh, worship of Baal was, uh, was extant. Now, when Jesus says, on this rock, remember he was standing near this rock. Caesarea Philippi, it is identified in the scriptures, all right? And one theologian, and his name is Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, he says the following. He says, Christ actually meant this, this geographical location. He was talking about the rock below Mount Hermon, where Baal was worshiped. And why would he say, on this rock, I will build my church? And this, the later part of the verse also gives a clue. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. What he tries to explain it as is that Jesus Christ, his church will begin to conquer death because the worship of Baal and all of those pagan gods was, was basically identified with death. And Jesus is saying, I will begin to conquer death upon this rock where Baal was worshipped, right? In other words, uh, he's saying the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of death will not be able to stop the, uh, the starting and the flourishing of the church of God, right? Uh, another translation says the gates of Hades will not withstand it. In other words, this is the beginning of the church. Nothing can stop it, right? And the church will be uh, uh, an agency to bring life into the world, all right? So that is how Dr. Michael Heiser explains it. And I thought that was a very interesting explanation. But my view, if you'll ask for my view, I would say that perhaps this is inclusive, right? Could it be that Jesus 
does mean himself because uh, we are told by the Apostle Paul, Jesus and the Apostles are the foundations of the church. Let me read to you from Ephesians 2. This is not in the, this is not in the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, let me just stop sharing that for just a moment. Let me just read to you uh, Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 19, it says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers talking to the church, the members in, in, in Ephesus, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Verse 21, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So if uh, the apostle says that uh, the apostles and the prophets and are the foundation and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. When Jesus says, I will build on this rock, I will build my church. It could have a reference to the apostles, not just Peter, himself as a chief cornerstone. And Dr. Heiser's explanation also seems quite plausible because he is saying that Caesarea Philippi is where they were standing on a rock and you know the church will begin its mission and conquer death and all the pagan gods will begin will will become a tombstone for them he the church will make the worship of pagan gods in other words a tombstone right the gates of hell will not uh, you know prevail against it all right one more thought from the scripture Notice he says, I will build, and I think I already mentioned that it's not a human enterprise, but with human participation. It is not humans who build the church. It is Christ who builds the church in the Holy Spirit, but with human participation. And that's why Jesus gives us the great commission. Go and preach the gospel. And as people will come into the church, that is the building of the church. And as more and more people are saved, that is the end of death, right? Saved from, you know, death. Okay, so having mentioned that, let me just quickly go back to my screen. All right. All right, so this is the beginning of the church. Let's look at the birth of the church uh, and we will just quickly see, um, you know, uh, the time of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I will read just uh, a few portions from this. I don't have it on the screen, but let me just uh, read to you and you can follow along. Um, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, I'm reading from Acts chapter 2 verse 1. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay. Um, I, will, I will go from, you know, uh, from screen to back to all of you. So do uh, uh, be ready to keep, you know, looking at uh, different screens. Pentecost is sometimes called the Feast of the Harvest or the Day of First Fruits. We know that from the Old Testament. And it is according to some Jewish uh, beliefs that the giving of the Old Covenant and the law on Mount Sinai was probably on the, on the Day of Pentecost. That's how Jews tend to explain it. And interestingly enough, here is an, uh, uh, an occasion when God's people were all gathered together and the Holy Spirit descends upon the, uh, the leaders. The Spirit coming in human, uh, you know, uh, 
the, the spirit coming on the day of Pentecost is like a second giving of the law, right? Uh, just to, just to uh, tie it up with what the Jewish belief of the first giving of the law was on the day of Pentecost, maybe on Mount, you know, on Mount Sinai. The spirit coming probably was also on the, of course, obviously is on the day of Pentecost. In other words, perhaps an indication that the spirit replaced the law as the guide for God's people. As, uh, Paul's, as Paul says, the law of the spirit who gives life, this Holy Spirit now becomes our guide uh, specifically. All right. So here is the Holy Spirit now coming into uh, God's people. There is a mention of the rushing wind, uh, probably a physical manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you remember, Jesus talks about the wind blows, talking about the spirit and birth, a spiritual birth, right? Uh, but perhaps what we need to understand is the ministry of the Holy Spirit is crucial in the building of the church. And the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is very much present in the past 2000 years as the church has unfolded its mission here on this earth. There was also mention of fire or cloven tongues of fire, right? Fire is another symbol of the divine presence of God. Uh, if you remember, Yahweh appeared to Moses in, in flames of fire, uh, the burning bush. Uh, and of course, John the Baptist speaks of the Messiah coming and baptizing in the Holy Spirit. So perhaps there is all uh, reference to this or maybe a connection to all of this. Now, what I want to really go, like, like I said, I'm not doing an exposition of any of these scriptures. But uh, I want to more uh, align it with our subject of church history. All right. Notice, uh, let me now I'm, uh, go back to the screen. Notice uh, the scripture here in Acts chapter 2. Notice it says, then verse 8, how is it that each of us hears them in our native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, verse 10, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, verse 11, both Jews and converts to Judaism, uh, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Obviously, we have studied that in the past, and we know that uh, Everybody heard in their own language. Uh, and that was an absolute miracle. And speaking, it was, it was literal tongues, literal languages of all of these people because they all heard it in their own tongue, as it says in verse 11. All right. The question I want to ask is, why so many languages? And obviously, there were people from all of these places who were listening and hearing, and these were mostly Jews who had settled in these areas. Remember, the Jews were taken captive and they were spread across, uh, you know, Judea and, you know, and uh, the furthest parts of Judea in Africa, in Europe, in Asia. They were all scattered. They came to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. And so they were listening to the gospel being preached by Peter in their own language. Right? The fact that so many languages are mentioned is interesting that it was symbolic now. The time had begun. The gospel should go out into all the world. The gospel is not just to remain among uh, or in Jerusalem or among the Jews, but people who were converting and coming into the faith, they were all now be going to become part of uh, God's people. In other words, the church is going to be all over the world. It is not going to be concentrated in one small area, geographical area. And this is where, if you remember, I mentioned the Pax, the Pax Romana, is uh, very interesting. You know, the Pax Romana is, 
is basically means the peace of Rome. In other words, when Rome had established itself, it enjoyed a certain sense of peace amongst in its empire. Not, not that there were no wars, they were continuously fighting. And if you remember, they also had to, had to fight the Jews. And in 70 AD, they had to come and break down the temple. But overall in the empire of Rome, the Roman empire, there was peace. And peace allowed the building of roads, peace allowed people to travel, right? Travel was made easy because Roman citizens could go in any part of the Roman empire. And hence, the gospel had the opportunity to begin to spread. And so the Pax Romana aided in the gospel to begin to start spreading in various parts of the Roman empire. And that's why the reason I say that perhaps the timing of the beginning of the church was quite ideal for the church to begin to flourish, the church to begin to be built all over the world, all right? Beginning in, of course, Jerusalem and going in the other uttermost parts of the world. So this is where the church was born and uh, there was no stopping it. And like we read in the, uh, in the scripture in Matthew, it will begin to invade hell, the place of death, Hades, as it is mentioned in the Old Testament. It will begin to conquer death. Uh, notice the last part of Acts chapter two. It says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In other words, they were escaping death. The church was beginning to exercise its mission and bringing people into salvation where they don't have to, uh, you know, be afraid of death, final death. Of course, physical death takes place. And Many miracles were being, were being uh, uh, you know, performed, which aided in the growth of the church. So this is how the church began. Uh, and I am going to actually stop there. And for today, I just want to leave you with those thoughts. And we will begin to then move on from there. And... I will uh, get into the timeline maybe a little later, but I want to open it up for some discussion now. Um, you're welcome to ask any questions uh, or I might, I might just bring in some points for discussion. I think Surimurti had a thought. Yes, Surimurti, go ahead. <laughs> the disciples had assembled in a house This house was not a residential accommodation. This was a house of prayer. This was a temple, temple itself. Why I'm saying this? I will tell you next time because I have to recollect. That is the reason why you see so many people there. Greeks, Phrygians, and so many other types of people. Okay. This is not a residential house. It was a temple. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's an aside, but that's not my main focus, whether it was a temple, whether it was a house, where, you know, my focus is uh, the beginning of the church. Right. My comment is incidental. Yeah. <laughs> because we always think it is a residential house. Okay, it all right. It's not a residential house. All right, well taken. Uh, but, the church now begins its presence. And let's not forget Jesus Christ builds the church, right? Any questions or any comments you'd like to make? Otherwise, I would like to bring in some points for discussion so that we can make it as enriching as possible. Let me just see if there are any hands going up, not yet. If not, let me go back to my screen and uh, I'm, I'm once again, remember, I'm trying to 
present these uh, this information so that we learn something today. Uh, we obviously don't want to just stay with history, but we want to see how it applies to us today. Remember, I said that. Uh, uh, let me just get to the uh, uh, to the screen. Okay. Uh, look at uh, the first one. And my question there is, or a, a discussion point there is, what is the folly of trying to build the church on human popularity? And we know that there are a lot of celebrity pastors who think that they are the ones building the church uh, with their own effort. The reason I bring this up for discussion is that Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. But uh, unfortunately, there are uh, many churches that run on the steam of people run on the popularity of people, run on the expertise and the, uh, you know, uh, all of this of people. So what, 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 what would you like to say about this? Uh, the discussion point being, what, is, what, is, what could be the uh, folly, the, the, the repercussion, the, the problem, the difficulty when we try to think that the church belongs to us? Okay, I hope you've seen the question. Suryamurthy, go ahead. See, it, 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 this has bothered me for a long time. <laughs> there are so many churches. People are attending those churches as following their ways. ways. Will they be in the resurrection? Different kinds of people following different ways, different churches. Are they going to be in the resurrection? Wow. <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> That's a question. And I don't think any one of us can answer. You're asking the question about judgment. Let's leave that to Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? Uh, whether they'll be in the resurrection or not is not for us to say. Uh, we know that uh, there are people who think that the church belongs to them. And yes, uh, there are, uh, and many of them have uh, uh, started churches and many of them have gone awry, things have gone wrong, um, uh, you know, is Jesus Christ. So any, any thoughts from anybody? Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Please make sure you unmute. Yes. Uh, could it be that these people that you're referring to and uh, Surya Muthi about different churches being raised and uh, they run on their own steam and uh, no, on popularity and, uh, you know, they go by, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in a different churches that we see, which are uh, uh, really not part of the true church. And uh, do you think they are not realizing it? Uh, they, they are deceived into it? Uh, you brought up an interesting thought there, true church. <laughs> How many people have started churches thinking they are the true church? Right. And we don't have to go very far. <laughs> we know that we ourselves made that mistake, thinking that we are the true church. And that is another deception. That is another deception to think that God can use or, uh, you know, uses only one person and that he's not, you know, he can't use even churches that are, you know, uh, you know, no church is perfect in that respect. Right. So, uh, but uh, I think uh, the point you brought up, Bertie, is very interesting that some people think that they have started the true church. And uh, that's so unfortunate that the church is much bigger than them, right? And then there are others who think that the entire church has gone wrong. Now, yes, you know, I, I already said church, no church is perfect. But to think that the, the, uh, all the churches in the world are false is also trying to, to bring as cast aspirations on Jesus who said, I will build my church, right? So Jesus has built his church. Now, how do we define church is, of course, uh, you know, uh, maybe beyond the scope of this session, uh, but we do know that church is people, not buildings. Church is people who belong to Jesus Christ. It goes beyond denomination. It goes beyond any particular name or society that is started or legal entity. It is a spiritual body. We know that much. I hope that we are not missing that point. 
right? So the church is everybody who belong to the body of Christ, uh, you know, beyond denominations, beyond legal entities. Bertie, go ahead. Somebody made a comment that, uh, uh, yeah, though the churches are deceived, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, could be, you know, deceived into thinking that they have, uh, they have a mission or they have raised or they're part of the true church. Somebody made a mention that although that's not true, but there could be God's people in these deceived churches, you know. Uh, <laughs> And so we are not to worry. As you say, it's Christ, uh, prerogatives, Christ, uh, you know, they are his sovereignty. Uh, uh, as he knows, uh, you know, who are his. Jesus Christ made a remark, I know mine and mine know me. And, uh, uh, you know, could it be so that people are there uh, uh, which are connected to the body of Christ, but are, uh, are in the, these uh, churches, so-called churches, and uh, but my question is, if if they are in the churches, uh, 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 why doesn't God draw them out of it? You know, why why doesn't God separate them, so to speak, uh, from uh, from the others? <laughs> yeah. Once again, you're asking questions that uh, that f f basically has no answers. <laughs> I'll have to only ask God. <laughs> I look, I can only speculate, but you know, let's, let's keep in mind, Jesus said, I will build my church and hence the church exists today. Right? Amen. Uh, to anyone who says that the church is all deceived and they're all wrong is actually saying Jesus Christ was wrong. So that is one big problem. On the other hand, to anyone to think that they are the only true church is completely deceived, Right. And so, like you rightly said, Bertie, the church is God's people who belong to Jesus Christ, irrespective of denomination and legal entity. Okay. Yes, Surya Murthy, go ahead. There are some serious churches. They simply worship according to whatever they feel is right. But they are not casting aspirations. They are not thinking they are the two churches. I appreciate them. Okay. They are not thinking anything about other people. <laughs> they simply worship according to what they feel is right. Well, amen to that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, thankfully, God has corrected us and we have come to understand that there are true Christians in various denominations, uh, even in denominations that we think are devilish. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but there are true Christians everywhere, you know, because Jesus' words cannot, you know, uh, be contradicted. He said, I will build my church and the church will exist. And so, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's remember that. Any other thoughts on this? Otherwise, we can go to uh, the second discussion point. Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Uh as, as Bertie was saying that uh, when God uh, knows this, then why does he take us out of it? Okay, so what I feel is that he does take, he has his people, his chosen ones, whom he takes out, whether it is earlier in life or later in life. He takes them out. He knows, he knows where to put them, when to put them. So he has his time. Like, for example, me. I've been to Catholic churches, I've been to uh, uh, this, as you say, these AGs, this Methodist, and I've been to so many, but he chose me to come to Grace Church. So, I mean, he has his pur purpose in life, he knows, and at this age to, to show me the path, which path to follow and to really get to know him the way I should know him. So, yeah, he, he, he builds his churches and he has his people, I think, and he does is his way. Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> thanks for mentioning that, Vanessa. I understand what you're saying. Uh, but, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's recognize that God uh, helps every Christian who, who truly believes in him and wants to grow. They will grow. And if they are in toxic churches, in deceived churches, in churches that are completely, you know, uh, unbiblical or going against the Bible, I think God will make provision for them 
to be able to grow in fellowships that are healthy. And that's the reason why in GCI, we talk about a healthy church. We want to be a healthy church, you know, uh, so that our members are well spiritually nurtured and helped and strengthened so that they can come closer and closer to Jesus Christ, right? So um, uh, like you said, you know, God has his ways. The Holy Spirit has his ways of uh, helping each one of us to grow, all right? And uh, uh, if you have been blessed in GCI, I mean, we are, we are, we are blessed as you are blessed, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, we, can, we can come back to these uh, thoughts. Let me just introduce the second one because my questions were on uh, the, today's discussion. Uh, notice the second question. Should the church be accepting of multiculturalism, allowing differ differing practices in worship, lifestyle, etc.? Uh, the reason I ask this question is you remember the gospel began to go to all kinds of languages which means cultures, uh, ways of living, people who are in different parts of the world with different lifestyles, different perspectives, different cuisines. So uh, what are your thoughts on the church being accepting of various ways of doing things and practices? All right. Uh, once again, I hope you got the question. All right. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so that the church can truly be international in its perspective, uh, accepting people from various parts of the world without any kind of differentiation, without any discrimination. Unfortunately, the church has been known to be discriminating, and uh, that is uh, very unfortunate. What do you think about that? Or what, do, do, you, do you think there are any... Um, boundaries for us not to cross when it when, when we come to a sense of unity Anil, I th I, did i hear uh, see you raising your hand i'm not sure well <clears throat> i think there is nothing wrong with multiculturalism different uh, countries or different uh, you know uh, geographical areas will have different cultures and so that's to be accepted in, a, in, in the local churches. But I think where the important thing comes in is the, uh, as long as the worship and the teachings are biblical, that's all that matters. You know, I, I, I think some people get hung up on the music. Okay, I don't like the music in this church. So, you know, this is not a good church. Or, you know, the pastor is spending too much time on Genesis and not on Revelation. So... I don't think these are the issues that should concern the thing and multiculturalism and all that is just fine. But the main thing is yes, a biblical teaching, biblical oriented church. That's all that matters. That, I mean, that's what I think. Yes. Yeah. Well said, uh, Anil. Thank you. Uh, you know, I keep hearing about uh, churches that are uh, Filipino church, Nepali church, Keralite church, uh, and they seem to... <laughs> They seem to be so focused on their uh, culture, you know, or, or way of doing things. And uh, in an age where nationalism is becoming so strong now, and nations are asserting that this nation is only for this people and this language and this, you know, it's very unfortunate that the church sometimes becomes like that. We begin to right. ape the world. Right. And we say, oh, this church is only for the Filipinos or the Nepalis or the Goans or the Telugus. <laughs> uh, uh, the church is supposed to be accepting of all blacks, whites, browns, right? <laughs> if there are browns. Uh, uh, no, you, you say people of color, right, Adil? <laughs> as long as they don't teach in tongues. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, sorry about that. As long as there is unity in worship, the multiculturalism is okay. There should be unity of worship. Right. Okay. One should not say, I will worship Passover. Another yeah. will say, I will do something else. 
Absolutely. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, God is not the author of confusion. And uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, a God of order. And, and the Apostle Paul talks about order in the church, even though we accept uh, everybody in the church. Um, let me just read you one uh, uh, quotation from uh, Gary Dedo, who is, uh, you know, part of our church. He says, not all differences of every kind belong in the body of Christ. Differences that undermine unity in Christ inherently that are inherently divisive are to be avoided. So in that respect, I think uh, uh, we must protect the unity in Christ under the Holy Spirit. But to discriminate amongst people and to say that this race doesn't belong here, this caste doesn't belong here, or this, this uh, particular speaking you know, language doesn't belong here, uh, the church must not, uh, must not succumb to that temptation of becoming divisive in that respect. Right? Music styles, yes, I suppose some people love the, uh, the, the band and baja today, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there are people who only love the Old uh, Gregorian chants. <laughs> you know, the Gregorian chants are wonderful. I don't know if you've heard it, but I, it just, it's very so peaceful. Uh, but yes, the old hymns are beautiful. So um, any other thoughts on this? Well, um, over here, there's a big uh, thing about, you know, uh, uh, whether the church should be uh, introducing or receptive to receiving different people of different sexual orientation. You know, that's a big thing. Now, so uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> I don't uh, think it's a problem in India or is it? I don't know. Yeah. That's a can of worms. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, well, I, all I'll say is this. The, uh, from a GCI perspective, we do uphold biblical standards of sexuality. And I think sometime in the past, we did discuss about sexuality, maybe very briefly. Uh, we do hold the, uphold the standards of sexuality, but we do not say that somebody cannot come uh, to church just because was somebody struggling with a particular lifestyle or a sexual preference. Uh, but if there is somebody who is dividing the church on sexual preferences, then of course we will, uh, we may have to stand against that. But if someone is struggling and saying that I want to be part of this church, I, I do struggle with you know a particular sexual orientation uh, and they seek maybe a help, they seek a sense of family within the church. Uh, we are all out to help. May I mention that, you know, we had somebody in church who uh, had a problem, a personal problem. I won't go into the actual uh, problem, but the person had a problem and struggled with a habit but I, as a pastor, allowed him to come to church, even though he had a particular habit. And we as a church wanted to be accepting and helpful. But I told him that if that habit begins to manifest itself in divisive ways that causes problems in the church, then I will, I will have to put my foot down and say, I'm sorry that uh, we, we can't allow this. So that is how I look at it. I don't know uh, if anybody else has any thoughts on that, uh, you know, but under no circumstance, we will compromise on the biblical standard of sexuality, right? And if you want to know GCI, uh, you know, let me know and I can all send you a document on that. All right. I hope that discussion was helpful and uh, uh, we have just a few minutes left to, um, uh, can I then just go to my timeline and just, just briefly mention the timeline and then, then we will end. I'm going to go back to my screen 
And I'm going to share a Word document now. Can you see that document, uh, Praveen? Yes. Okay, I'm not sure uh, how small it is. Uh, for some reason, I'm not able to uh, make it larger. Okay, if you notice their timeline, of church, I, I, I've taken this from uh, the internet. This is one of the many, and I'm just uh, presuming that, you know, I'm just giving you something. I may use something else later on, but uh, uh, okay, yeah, Praveen is going to help us with uh, uh, making it a little bigger for us. Oh, okay, all right, excellent. So hope you can see that. Okay, so um, we began today at AD, I mean to say, uh, AD 33, Pentecost. <laughs> All right, we discussed Pentecost. Next time I will discuss the council at Jerusalem. Oh boy, Praveen, how did it go? <laughs> okay, let me just see if I can get it back. Uh, right, can you, is it on the screen now? Yes. Okay, all right. So we are, uh, we, we are basically in the New Testament era where we discuss Pentecost, the Council at Jerusalem, I will discuss next time. And then there is destruction of Jerusalem as foretold by Christ and the book of Revelation written in the 90s, right? So that completes the New Testament era. After that, we get into what we call is the patristic era or the age of the church fathers. Justin Martyr, uh, you know, and very councils. And I will try to pick up uh, relevant events in church history and bring those to discussion with all of you. And obviously cannot, you know, it cannot be exhausted. So I'll have to pick and choose. I will pick and choose what I feel is uh, important for us to know as the church uh, unfolds. If you notice the numbers, there are the years. All right, Council of Chalcedon, all right? Now you come down to the Great Schism. This is 1054 AD, 1000 years after the New Testament era, right? This is where the church split. It was one universal church and then Roman Catholicism split from the, from the Orthodox church and became a separate denomination, if you notice. This happened in 1054 and we will study that as we come to that. And as we go down the line, uh, if you notice 1517 is when Martin Luther uh, posted his theses uh, and Protestant, Protestantism began. So the Protestants uh, split from the Catholic church and they began, but don't forget the blue line, the blue line, the the Orthodox Church continued, and today they come under the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, uh, the Syrian Orthodox. Uh, and uh, I would say that some of our churches in Kerala belong to the Orthodox tradition. So you have the Orthodox traditions continuing. You have Roman Catholicism that came into existence 1000 years after. And then about 1500, about 1500 years after the New Testament era, Protestantism came into existence. And then, of course, on and on it goes until the present day. And of course, these are the main divisions, the Orthodox, the Catholicism and Protestantism. And then there are many other, uh, what do you call it, uh, splits, the Church of England, you know, the Anglican Church, and then many other uh, Church of God, Seventh Day, <laughs> right? Worldwide Church of God, all of this comes uh, into this. Okay. So what I plan to do is, uh, go through this uh, timeline. I'll pick up important events that took place and then discuss them and see it's for its relevance today. How does that sound? Is that, does it sound okay? All right. Okay, all right, then uh, time is more or less up. Uh, yes, Franklin, you had a thought, go ahead. Please make sure you unmute, yes. Sir, sir one simple question, sir, one simple question. When we say the church began and began to spread, are we saying that salvation was not available to the general public? Okay. When you say general public, uh, are you talking about those outside the church? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, that, of course, is a question that is a theological one, which we need to discuss, you know, uh, redemption, salvation, people in the church. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if Praveen is going to discuss that, <laughs> uh, but uh, he, was, he was thinking, maybe Praveen will bring some thoughts uh, on that. But remember, salvation is available, to, to give you a simple answer, salvation now is available when Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is finished. He accomplished salvation for humanity. The, the veil in the temple was torn, and the divide between humanity and God now is no more. God is at one with mankind. But the question is, do people accept that free gift of salvation? So when you say, is salvation available? Yes, it is available to everyone. Do people accept it? I don't know. But the people in the church who have come to have faith in Jesus, I believe have accepted salvation in the faith that they repose in Jesus Christ. Does that, does that make any sense, Franklin? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your sir, participation. Sir, yeah. sir, Bertie had a question. Uh, he had a question. All right. No, Who, Mr. Perkins, no. Okay. All right. I thought you were going to speak for Bertie, but Bertie says no. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for joining in. Keep thinking about some of these thoughts. If you should have any questions and you want any further clarifications, I'm always available to help you. Thank you. And, God bless. Right. And uh, then let's, let's end thanking God for this time together. Vanessa, can I request you to to close in prayer today. Thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, Lamb of God, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, I thank you and we all thank you that you let us live for this wonderful day to see your glorious, powerful, mighty works. I thank you for this night that you have put before each one of us. I thank you for giving us the time that we were able to attend this Bible study to get to know so much. We thank you for sending pastor into our lives who convey your word to us in the way that we understand and we want to have faith and believe in you. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we ask you for your grace and your blessings on each one of us and our families our near and dear ones and the people who have come into our lives and are helping us and guiding us in so many ways. In Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you. God bless you. Have a good evening to the, those of us in India and a lovely day for Anil and Rekha.